Okay, this is Christian Bible Chapel, and we're here this evening for our evening class, and we thank the Lord for uh, the members here at Christian Bible Chapel joining us uh, personally and by presence and, or by Facebook and, and YouTube and phone. And we praise God. So we're going to continue our lesson on the sovereignty of God. But, you know, uh, we want to go into a word of prayer, and afterwards I want to sort of uh, – sing or, or, or read a, a, a song written by uh, Martin Luther. All right, so let's have prayer first, all right? Father, we thank you for our gathering uh, this evening for this uh, hour of Bible study. And as we go into the Word of God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will so lead us uh, according to the knowledge that he will give us to understand the word of God. Help us as believers in Christ, uh, whoever we may be, whatever country we may be in, because I know many are listening, and we thank God for our brothers and sisters in Africa in particular, how they are so faithful and in tuning into us in Bible class. We give, you, we give God the praise for you guys over there as you preach the word of God and as you we pray that God will continue to strengthen you. We pray for those who are hospitalized, those who are sick and afflicted. Uh, we pray for those who are burdened and down. Many are struggling um, and many are hurting right now, Father. We pray that the power of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God will overshadow all what is taking place in our, in our society in America as well as in the uh, countries of Africa, the Asia and Europe, Ukraine and Russia, even Russia, Lord, South America, uh, Canada and other parts of the world, China, Japan, the Philippines, all the islands, whether it's uh, Haiti and uh, Jamaica, we pray for all Christians everywhere, wherever they are, we pray that you give them strength and comfort, dear God. And help us, O oh Lord, to understand the things that come upon us, that no matter how tragic and how hurting it may be, no matter how horrific, no matter how sickly and hurting it may be, we may endure by your strength and by your power. We pray, Father, for the unsaved who do not have your comforting power, your comforting strength, our spirit, your grace, and your mercy. We pray, Father, that you would draw them as many will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Bless our country, bless our government and other governments all over the world. We pray for the leaders all over the world. We pray that they will make some sense out of the tragedy, the hurt, the, uh, the pain that many are feeling right now. May they learn to do the right thing. Make laws that are right for the people, that are governing the people rightfully. Bless us now as we go into the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our notes is coming from page 7, on the top of page 7, if you have your notes, if you haven't um, uh, numbered your page, it's on page 7. And we have number 4. God is sovereign in the exercise of his love. Now, there is a song uh, written by Martin Luther. It's called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Well, instead of playing it, um, I'm just going to go ahead and read the first part of it. Because it says, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he is, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe do seek to work us woe. His craft and power great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Well, Martin Luther wrote this song about the power and the majesty of God, how that God is sovereign. He is a mighty fortress, a bulwark, B-U-L-W-A-R-K, 
A bulwark is a solid wall-like structure raised for defense. And that's who God is. We all must have God on our side as our bulwark, a solid wall-like structure raised for defense that nothing can hurt us. The scripture says in John 10, it says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The child of God has, has within his uh, position the very, the very God on his side. Without God in your life, on your side, you will perish. Now, our subject today, our subject today is the sovereignty of God, uh, his love. Now, this is going to be a very difficult uh, teaching, uh, preaching lesson because even as believers in Christ, we many find hard to grip concerning God's love. It's often said that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin in his life. That is not scripture. There's nowhere it can be found in scripture. There's nowhere implied in scripture. It cannot be found in scripture. It cannot be implied in scripture. True, God hates sin. If God was to love sinners, all sinners, then all will be saved. And that speaks of a universal salvation, which means that the atonement of Jesus Christ is unlimited. All will eventually be saved. But this is not true. This is the Bible doesn't speak of. And I know many people turn to the, the scripture, John 3, 16, but they do not have a accurate understanding of John 3, 16. All right? Um, passage of scripture that we want to look at, as you see on the board here, the sovereignty of God, God's sovereign love, God foreknew and predestined his love upon certain individuals for salvation. Others, he chose to pass by. Now, it's going to be a combination in our lesson today uh, as you turn to page 7 on your, in, your, in your books. If you haven't numbered them, well, just turn page six, turn to 7 and on the top it's going to say God is solving in the exercise of his love. That is a hard saying. That's a hard saying. Because we're so used to hearing that God loves everyone. God loves the sinner. And many, many, many people, whether it's the preacher or the uh, lay person, which is the average Christian, they go out and witness and say, God loves you. He died on the cross for you. He shed his blood. Why don't you receive Christ? Why don't you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Number one, you can't accept Christ. It's not an acceptance. It's receiving. The Bible nowhere says accept Christ as Savior. The Bible says nowhere say the sinner's prayer. The Bible nowhere says come to the altar. But churches are doing it. Churches are saying, say the sinner's prayer. Churches are saying, come to the altar to get saved. Churches are saying, come to the mourner's bench, you know, and cry out to Christ. The scripture doesn't approve that. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith. And see, this love that we're going to talk about is a love that is of God. It, it, it's of God. God is love. Right? Uh, we're going to look at scriptures starting with the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. Just write these down. I'll, I'll say them out. Write them down. Here we go. Get your pencil and paper. And write these down in your Bible or on, your, on a piece of paper. Right? That's Isaiah chapter 53. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Now, if you miss any of these, we're going to go over them again. That's Ephesians 5, 25. That's Ephesians 1, 4 to 6. Ephesians 2 and 4. Now, there's many scriptures, but these are the dominant ones that we, we want to look at. And, of course, the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. So let's first uh, 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 look at what we mean when we say that God loves. All right? Let me, let's, when we say that God is sovereign in the exercise of his love, we mean that he loves whom he chooses. God does not love everybody. And I know that's hard to swallow. I know that's hard. And we're so, see, what we, what we have done in witnessing is we're pacifying sinners. All right? we're, 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 we're sort of throwing it out there, the bait that will help them to come to Christ. But no person can come to Christ except the Father draw them. We're using wrong methods of witnessing and spreading the gospel. And it's wrong to tell people that God loves you. Right? God loves those whom he died for because he chose them from the foundation of the world. So you got to be careful when you go out there and witness and tell a lost sinner that God loves you. He came into the world and suffered and died on a cross for you. Now, suppose that person doesn't get saved. And majority of people that hears this statement, God loves you, will not get saved. Okay? And they die in their sins. At the judgment bar of God, they will attempt to use that as a strategy to get to heaven, and they will blame the preacher and even God because someone told them, see, this person is standing before the judgment bar of God, lost without Christ, Revelation chapter 20, the books were open, and they're going to use that statement to justify themselves that God ought to you know, escort them to heaven, allow them to go to heaven. And this is wrong. When we misunderstand a scripture, when we misquote a scripture, when we use scripture in an errorsome way, we do more hindrance than good. Now, in Isaiah chapter 53, I'm moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of other scriptures in the Old Testament, but Isaiah talks about the, the atoning death of the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. The word Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. Isaiah picks up his pen and writes about, in Isaiah 53, it says, Who had believed our message, Evangelion, which is the gospel? Who had believed our gospel, our report? Our message. Who, who has believed our report? Who can, who can believe the message of the, the true gospel? All right, here it is. To whom the arm of the Lord is revealed. God reveals his true message to the hearts of those whom he has chosen. And this choice of God has nothing to do with a decision. You're choosing him. You're saying a sinner's prayer, begging him, tithing, being baptized, speaking in tongues, joining the church, taking communion or the mass, doing good deeds, moral deeds, righteous deeds, so-called. A choosing God chooses by his own good pleasure, by his own for his own glory, those who will spend eternity with him. Such a hard thing to 
to, to believe, to accept, really, to many people. Because we've been plagued for centuries and centuries by the statement that God loves everyone. God loves you. God doesn't love the devil. There's nothing that God... See, if God loves everyone, every angel, then he must love the devil. But there's nothing of the devil, about the devil, that God loves. God hates sin. Right? God hates sin. Right? And sin must be punished. See, salvation is all about God. On my left here, I have on the board, we got to be saved from God. We, if we got to be saved from God by God. That, that, that sounds that sound kind of crazy, doesn't it? But it's true. We have to be saved from God, by God. See, punishment is issued for the wages of sin. Because of sin. Sentence, the sentence pronounced by the judge to the offender. We are the offender. God is the judge. Salvation must be obtained before the trial. That is death. Trial is the death. Or the sentence definitely will be executed. God's justice demands we all be punished for the crime of sin. Yet only through the atoning, Christ's atoning death, God's wrath has been propitiated or averted in order that some might be saved. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he became the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means in that verse, Romans 3:24 or 25, he is the propitiation whom God set forth to be a propitiation for our sins. Our sins. Our sins. Propitiation means to avert the wrath of God. God's wrath is upon every sinner, every sinner. Yet from Adam to the last person, though the wrath of God is upon all, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God in his mercy, we discussed that last week, by his grace and love, chooses to save some and bring some out from his wrath. That's his choice. And that's why in Romans 9, 13, it says, I would have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now there's some words here we've been uh, we've been saying we we said about love agape true divine love we talked about the word uh, justice because justice demands that sin be punished see. Justice, justice doesn't care who you are. All right. Let me, let me look at my notes here. I want to say something here. See, because justice says you are guilty and you deserve to be punished. Justice demands the impartial enforcement of the law. Justice requires that each 
shall receive his or her legitimate due, neither more nor less. Justice bestows no favor. Justice is no respecter of person. That's justice. But here comes grace. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of God. Grace does not have to be shown. That's when, see, that's when God steps in and says, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you. Now, the choice of God, as Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, has been since before the foundation of God. God foreknew, he predestined, he chose within the condemned of mankind those who will spend eternity with him. Now, let's use a number. Let's just use a number hypothetically. Let's use the number that all of us can understand. Twelve. Twelve apostles. Okay, twelve. God, out of twelve people on this planet, he chose only two. I don't, he, he just, he passes by. Now, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. Why did God just choose two out of 12? That's his choice because he's what? Sorry. Remember what we talked about through scriptures, that is, that as Sorry and God, according to Daniel chapter 4, verse 25, he is, no one can help him make up his mind. Isaiah 46, I am God and there is none other. Whatever, everything that's been done, has done, and will be done, I did, I, 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 I did it in the beginning. I, I allowed it. I, I am sorry. I am God. And we discussed all that. Right? But what we're trying to get, we as Christians and you as an unbeliever to know is that we are sinners. And because we are sinners, the word sinner means one who practices sin, one who is born in sin. Right? And because of sin, our flesh, our body is cursed. The ultimate end of all any sinner, I started to say all, but not all, some, would be death. The, the wages of sin is death. Right, now let's look at Isaiah, because Isaiah is going to use some particular words concerning whom did Christ die for? Whom did Christ die for? Who did Christ, who did God love? Does he love everyone? That's the Soviet love. You would think that, see, humanly, we would think, oh, God loves everybody. He wouldn't send nobody to hell. All of us eventually will go to heaven. But this is not Bible. It is not Bible to say God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. That is not implied in the scriptures. The scripture does not teach that. Okay, let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he has bore our griefs. Listen, listen to the words now. Our griefs and carried our sorrows. Okay, see, the, see those words? Our. He has bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. Look at verse 5, Isaiah 53 and 5. He was wounded, killed for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. 
See, the word there, our, see, Isaiah keeps using the word our. He's not elaborating that. He's not saying everybody, all peoples, all humans. He's saying our. And he continues this through all when he says in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I understand that I'm, 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 I'm switching from New, Old Testament to New Testament because there are some who use scriptures for their benefit to, to preach a uh, universal salvation that God loves everybody. And one of the scriptures that they use is 1 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See, if that scripture is true, then John 10, 28, 29, and 30 speaks against that. And we must not have any contradiction. There must not be one contradiction in the Holy Scriptures, because if there's one contradiction in the Holy Scriptures, then that means that the Scriptures is fallible. But the Scriptures is inerrant, infallible. It cannot have any error. It cannot fail. The scriptures are holy and righteous. It's God breathed. It is God's word. So when the scripture says this in 1 Timothy 2 and 4, who will have all men to be saved? See, in the in the classical Greek, in that verse of scripture, see, we're we're eyeing it as English, as Africans, as Chinese, as Indonesians, as Australians, as Britons, as Canadians, and we're looking at it and we say, oh, everybody can get saved. All men will be saved. Instead of looking at it in the Greek language in which who will have all men, all men is a, is, is a qualified word in the Greek. And what Paul is talking about, and he's talk, dealing with Christians here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We leave the context of the Greek text. We're failing in our exegesis of the scriptures, and we're using eisegesis, which means, eisegesis means that you're adding to the scriptures what the scriptures is not saying. We're not doing proper hermeneutics of the scriptures. Now, another passage of scripture people use. I'm turning, 2 Corinthians. And this is what another favorite people use in Second Corinthians chapter five. Look at, listen to verse uh, 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 verse nineteen. See, we jump on verse nineteen, but then we don't even realize that chapter, verse seven, sixteen, seventeen, and from eighteen backwards is talking to believers in Christ. So we see we we use. Chapter 19 to prove our denominational teaching, our upbringing, or our seminar teaching. That see, that's what it is. Oh, God's going to save everybody. God is going. No, you, you can't do that. Let's read Second Corinthians 5:19. It says, "To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself." See that? I mean, you see that preacher? There it is. The world. God is going to save the world. God is he's changing the world. I mean, look out your window. Is the world changing? <laughs> I mean, that's just common. Let's just think. The word reconcile means to be thoroughly changed from to. So who is he changing from to to? From sin, enmity, hatred, child of devil, to child of God, to righteousness, to holiness. That's what reconcile means. To wit that God, this is the incarnation, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. All right, keep on reading. See, don't just stop reading at a certain pause, clause, 
Keep on reading. Here we go. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not charging their sins. See that? There it is. Their sins. See, we jump the gun. We 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 just we follow the theologians, we follow the the fathers, we follow the 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 history and the seminar and, the, and denomination without rightly dividing the word of God. See, that's one of the most noble things that Paul marked about the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. He says this. These were more noble than the Bereans in that they searched the scriptures. They searched the scriptures. While Paul was speaking the truth of God's word using the Old Testament, of course, the Torah and you know, many things, the Christians at that time had a copy of the Old Testament. They were just going through Isaiah. They were flipping. When Paul started quoting and saying this about Daniel and Psalms, and, and they said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Daniel, yeah, you're right. See, because the New Testament wasn't being wasn't written then. Right? So they had to rely on the Old Testament. To wit that God was in Christ. This whole chapter is speaks of and is speaking to the believers in Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25. It says this. Nothing twisting, nothing Sherman is doing. It's what the scriptures are saying. The scripture speaks for itself. And you see, this is the whole reason for the reformation of the reformers saying, no, we got to restore the scriptures back. Because the scriptures interpret the scripture, not the church in, in, interpret it. The church should not be in, interpreting the scriptures, no matter how noble, how esteemed, how doctorate they are in, how intelligent a man is, no matter who the fathers are, the scriptures have to interpret the scriptures. Okay? Mark this, Ephesians 5.26. 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, the church. I mean, you can't get any plainer than that. All right. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. I hope you're writing this down now, Ephesians 2 and 4. It says this. But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us. Who is the us? Paul is talking about the regenerated. Remember verse 1? And you have he quickened who were dead in trust, controlled by sin. You used to walk to the according of course of this world, according to the uh, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Among others, we had all our conversations in time past. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy. So we have mercy. We have compassion. We have grace. And we have love. But you see, at the same time, there is justice, there is punishment, there is the anger and the wrath of God, and God cannot acquit the wicked. This is the Old Testament prophecy saying, or it's the scriptures, it's saying God cannot acquit the wicked. God will not, at the judgment bar of God in Revelation chapter 20, when the wicked stands before him, he cannot say, he cannot say that he's going to say to the sinner, oh, okay, you joined the church, you jumped over the broom, you spoke in tongue, you 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 got baptized, you you gave money, you gave blood to the Red Cross, and God says, No, I cannot acquit the wicked. Your sin needs to be dealt with. 
You need to be punished. I am God. I love. Yes, I am. An, I am God. I love because that's my attributes. That's who I am. I show mercy, truth. I show grace, true. But that grace is undeserved, is unmerited. And you have sought to work for your salvation. It's by grace are you saved through faith. Okay. You must be punished. You must be, the sentence must be pronounced, I am judge. I am God. You're standing before me. Now, the scriptures lets us know, as we turn back up another chapter, uh, a couple of verses, really, in Ephesians 1, uh, 4 to 6, it, it pushes out another verse that tells us that who God loves. Now, in all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the scriptures says that God loves the church. God loves those whom he has chosen, elect, old and new. Yet at the same time, the scripture shows that he has compassion. Right? He has compassion. Okay, uh, if there be 45 in this city, I would not destroy Solomon and Gomorrah. If there be 30, if there be 10, I will not destroy Solomon and Gomorrah. Right. So there was none. All right? And God destroyed Solomon and Gomorrah. God had compassion on Cain. Well, he said to Cain after he killed his brother Abel, God still reached out and showed compassion. But he didn't show love. He showed compassion. The rich man came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to be saved? Jesus has, says, have you kept the law? Thou shalt not steal, love your mother and father, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not. The man says, well, I've done all these since my youth. Jesus said to the young, to the young man, the rich man, he says, Jesus said to him, take all what you got, give it to the poor, follow me. The man turned around and went away sorrowful. Not because he was rich. But he, he didn't want, see his, his riches was his heart. His, he, he didn't honor God because the scripture says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your being. And that's the first commandment. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. His God was his riches. The scripture went on and said, just that next verse, notice what the scripture says. And Jesus looked at him and showed compassion. Then he says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, the disciples says, well, Lord, if it's, if it's, if it's that way, then nobody can be saved. Jesus says, with men, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So the love here. The love. The love of God is predestined. It was predestined. The word predestined. Destined means a, a, a place that you're going. You're going to a certain spot. You're going somewhere. Pre means before. So you plan to go somewhere, go to that spot, go, I hate using the word destiny, but I'm going to have to, you're going to that destiny, but it was pre-arranged. Foreknowledge. God foreknew. See, th that's, that's what made God the sovereign God. I am the almighty God. See, everything, every human being, every animal, every insect, every leaf, every molecule, every atom, Every cloud, every star, every Milky Way, every every planet, every star that is out there, God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word God is plural. 
It's a plural word in the Hebrew. Elohim is plural. See, here, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. God is one, but in essence, he's three. It's not three gods. It's one God and manifest in three persons. But his love is towards those whom he chose. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 4 to 6. According as he has chosen, the word chosen in the Greek is ek lego, which we say elect. According as he has chosen us, he didn't say everybody. He didn't say cosmos, world system. He didn't say world as aeon, human, mankind, everybody. And see, that's the confusion there. For God so loved the world. And so what we have done is we have used the world, the word aeon, A-I-O-N, or cosmos to picture God as loving every human being. But those two Greek words doesn't mean that. The word world means individuals, individuals, certain peoples the many, the us, the our, the we, here it is. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of, see, he's not adopting everybody. I mean, just look at it naturally. Do you go into an adoption agency and say, I want all the kids, I want everybody, just uh, take all of them home. No, you can only, only adopt a few, certain ones. The adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasures of his will. See, everything, the salvation that God shows, so God shows mercy and love to those who he chooses, but yet he, what about those he don't choose? A couple of weeks ago, we, 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 we scratched on the, the teaching, which is called double predestination. See, if, if it's, it's, I mean, just look at what we just read here. It says, according to the, to, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us. Now, I mean, there's a flip side to that. See, that's why in John in Romans 9, 13, it says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. See, that's where we get that double predestination. He shows mercy and love to those whom he sets his love towards. That's the positive decree of God. That's God actively intervening into the lives and the hearts of those whom he loved. Wherein those he does not love, he shows justice, which means those whom God passes by. Now, that's the hard thing to swallow. That, that in itself is a hard thing to swallow. I'm getting out of the way so you can see this over here, okay? So let's look at it. We have the word approbation, which means, the word approbation means those whom God set his love towards. Then if there are only those whom God sets his love for, what about those he doesn't do? Well, the, the, the other is reprobation, which means those whom God passes by. Now, what, what the seminar and many uh, people have began to teach beginning in the 19th century, so this stuff always happened in the 18 such and such and 19 such is new stuff. 
and it's called, let me put it up here in my chart here, and I have to hold it, well, maybe I hold it, I have some tape here. All right, okay. It's called equal ultimacy. This is a false teaching. Equal ultimacy. It is a false teaching. And what did it say? This is based on a concept of symmetry. Now, symmetry is that there got to be a balance. See, that's 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 logic. That's that's proper grammar. Grammar. Okay. In other words, what you do for one, you got to do for the other. That's what symmetric is. That's what that word means. You got to balance it. But we're talking about the sovereignty of God. We're talking about God. God doesn't have to balance. He's God. He, God is not governed by a rule. God rules the universe. He keeps the molecules together in a tree in our bodies. Our bodies are made up of millions of atoms. So it's that tree out there. So it's that leaf. So it's that flower. So it's this table. And if God was to relinquish his power, everything would just fall. Everything would just wither away because he is in control. A star cannot come and hit this planet and destroy it unless God allows it. Right? Everything. God is, God is in control. God knows everything, whether it's horrific death, whether it's suicide, whether it's killing, whether it's murder, everything that happens, God knew and God is allowing. And everything he allows for his glory, for his praise. And we look at it and say, wow, how, how can a building fall on 10 people and they die and it glorifies God? Because he is God. See, what we need to do is sit down and have some meditation about who God is and understand that God is God. He is the author. He is the authoritative person. He is the almighty God. Now, it says here, what that does, it seeks to complete a balance between election and reprobation. And that's false. There is no balance. If you do for them, God, if you save them, you got to do something for them. Well, who, who, who said God is under a law that he has to save everybody? God really doesn't have to save nobody. That's when mercy kicks in. That's when grace kicked in. His mercy and his grace, you are saved because of his mercy and his grace. He didn't have to do it. He could have what? Pass you by. You know that song? Pass me not, O gentle Savior. He could have passed you by. And that's what reprobation means. Let's, let's deal with that. See, EQ, which is equal ultimacy, is as God, as he intervene, intervenes into the life of a, of a sinner. Those he chooses. Now, now let, let, me, let, let me slow down. The whole world is plunged in sin. Every human being is under the wrath of God, Ephesians chapter 2. Every human being is, is born in sin and shaped in iniquity. All right? Let, remember that now. Mark that. Now, here comes God. He says, but I'm going to show mercy and grace and my love to certain ones I'm going to choose within that horribleness of sinners. I'm going to choose some to spend eternity with me. And then I'm going to let the rest face my justice. Oh, that's not fair. That's not fair. We all should have a chance. See, that, see this is not a lottery. There's no chances with God. There's such thing as good luck and chance. See, that's the false teaching of equal ultimacy. If God intervenes in the life of some and change their heart and their minds and causes them to hear the truth 
and causes them to repent of their sins, this teaching says, well, what you did for them, you got to do for others. No. No, 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 no. That's not what the scripture says. That's what some people believe. So what they say is that if since God intervenes in the life of those whom he's chosen and say, and, and as time go back past, I'm going to save some throughout human history. What this teaching says, now mark this, is that what God did is he creates within those he, whom he does not save or, or will not choose, he puts evil in their heart. That's what they teach. And this is being taught in many Bible seminars, and this is wrong. It's wrong. God doesn't create evil in anyone. Well, then, what does the word harden? What does the word harden mean? God hardens feral heart. For this reason have I hardened their hearts. What does the word harden mean? The word harden has nothing to do, now mark this, the word harden has nothing to do with God putting within a person's heart evil or wickedness. How so? How so? Because we're born that way. Why, why would God put evil or wickedness, 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 wickedness in us when we're already born a sin and shaped in iniquity? See, that doesn't make no sense. But what God does, see, all of us are sinners. All of us are under the wrath of God. All of us deserve, deserve the, the justice of God and his punishment. But God, in his love, in his mercy, by his grace, chooses to save some. Now, the author, another question people may ask is, well, we have a freedom to choose. God is intruding on my freedom and my will. There's an interesting book written by Martin Luther, again, called The Bondage of the Will. No, excuse me, Bondage of Sin. The Bondage of Sin, Martin Luther. That's one book. Another book, by Jonathan Edwards is called the freedom of the will. Now, true, we do have freedom to choose. True, we do have a will. But notice this now. Our freedom of choosing and our will has been tainted by sin. That's why we make the wrong, wrong choices. We our choice in coming to God will never come to us. It'll never come to us to repent of our sins. Man, since the Garden of Eden, has always been running from God. We're so we're so bondage, bondage to sin. Our will and our freedom and our choice has been tainted by sin. That's why we can't come to God. That's why we don't love God. Real, I mean, really, really love God. See, because the scripture says, if you love me, you would keep my commandments. Okay. Let's bring this to a close. Our time is gone. See, in the Reformed teaching, which is a Calvinistic view, and it, 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 it's, 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 it's really scripture, right? but in the view of, of reform, their view of predestination says this, that God chooses, God's choice precedes our choice. Did you get that? We make a decision. We choose God. But we can't choose God unless God first choose us. Because our heart is sinful and wicked. 
Our minds is, is dull. Our ears cannot hear. Our tongue is full of poison. We're, we're, we're cursed. We're under the wrath of God. We cannot come to God. So therefore, God has to make the choice first. When God makes the choice first, he intervenes in our lives and, 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 and puts us, put grace and faith, and he changes our minds and our hearts, which enable us to repent. Then we can make the choice. But we can't make a choice with a wicked heart. We can't make a choice with a, a mind that is depraved. Next week, we're going to look all inclusively on this, this teaching coming from Romans chapter 9. So your home assignment is to read Romans chapter 9 in its entirety because it is a chapter that is rarely preached or taught, but we're going to get through it, okay? We're going to get through it. And it's going to talk about, Paul is going to talk about God hating Esau. What does it mean when it says, I love Jacob? Now, Jacob was a sneak, a conniving, manipulative guy. But Esau was of good manner. Esau was of good behavior. Esau was a forgiving guy. You look at the Old Testament in the book in Genesis chapter 30 through 40. You read them stories about the two boys. Jacob was the one that was conniving, manipulative, sneaky, while his brother, twin brother, Jacob, was out front, honest, forgiving, and passionate. So next week, we're going to look at uh, the, book, uh, the, the series from uh, the teaching of the scripture from uh, Romans chapter 9, uh, verses, uh, uh, the whole chapter, really. We're aiming at verse 13. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. If you have your notes, continue to read your notes on page 7 because number 4 and 5 is God's sovereign in the exercise of his love. And number 5, it closes out, talks about God's grace is sovereign. He exercised his sovereignty and his grace. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your predestination as the scripture proclaims, we thank you, Father, for your foreknowledge. We thank you, Father, for your limited atonement. It's not nothing we boast in. We boast in Jesus Christ because it was his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection that approved that God will save some. We thank you for so loving the elect, the chosen ones, that you sent forth your son Jesus to die. We pray right now that many who have not trusted Christ as Savior, many of those who are living an open life of sin and disgrace, May the power of God's spirit move upon them and bring them to themselves that they may truly repent of their sins and cry out to God. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, we want to thank the Lord for each and every one of you uh, participating and coming in with us today. This is Christian Bible Chapel. And we are going to record this on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we thank the Lord. God bless. All right. Yeah. Okay, everybody. We thank the Lord. Huh? Oh, hey, Carl. Oh, hey, Carl. Hey, Wanda. <laughs> yeah, miss you. Yeah, miss you, too. Um, How you doing? I'm coming along. Um, coming yeah. home anytime soon? I don't know until I actually, you know, heal up and walk. You know, walk again. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Did the doctor come up? Did the doctor ever come up? <laughs>